Spaceflight is a world of extremes. Heat and cold, pressure and vacuum, speed and triumph, but also hubris, negligence, complacency, and greed. Today, we're in a golden age of reliable access to space, but it wasn't long ago that a seemingly minor oversight led to a disaster that kicked off a year-long period of incredibly spotty access to space. Nearly back-to-back, -back, three cargo supply missions would be lost, nearly cutting the space station off from unmanned resupply missions, and giving NASA and its crew a harsh reminder that space is never routine. This year of struggle started on October 28th, 2014, at 6.22 p.m. Eastern Daylight. Like time. That main engine's at 108 percent. Maybe I'll have power to go. And launch team, launch team, be advised, stay at your consoles. Everyone in the LCC, maintain your positions in your consoles. In the LCC, maintain positions at your console. From the NASA Independent Review Team report. In the past few years, as NASA has focused on developing capabilities to further human and robotic exploration beyond low Earth orbit, the agency has incubated new commercial capabilities to provide access to and support to the International Space Station, ISS. This effort established the framework to allow commercial companies to execute six consecutive and successful cargo transportation missions to the ISS. The NASA Independent Review Team, IRT, recognizes the incredible achievement of these efforts and believes that these are accomplishments for which NASA and its COTS and CRS contractors should be extremely proud. On October 28, 2014, at approximately 6.22 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, Orbital ATK launched its Orb 3 cargo resupply mission bound for the ISS from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, located on the eastern shore of NASA's Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia. The Orb 3 mission consisted of an Orbital ATK and Teres 130 launch vehicle and a Cygnus spacecraft loaded with approximately 2,296 kilograms or 5,057 pounds of pressurized cargo. The pre-launch press release provides slightly different mass numbers, and while it provides a slightly different total of 2,215 kilograms, it does give an idea of what sort of cargo was carried on the Cygnus. Orb 3 was Orbital ATK's third cargo delivery mission under its ISS CRS contract. Just over 15 seconds into the flight, an explosion in the Antares main engine system, MES, occurred, causing the vehicle to lose thrust and fall back toward the ground. The launch vehicle impacted near the launch pad, resulting in the loss of vehicle and cargo. Although there was damage to the launch pad and adjacent facilities and buildings, there were no injuries to members of the public or workers involved in the launch. Immediately following the accident, Orbital ATK established an Accident Investigation Board, AIB, and in November of 2014, the NASA Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations established the IRT to independently investigate the Orb 3 failure for NASA. The IRT performed detailed analysis and review of the Antares telemetry, as well as photographic and video media capturing the launch and failure. Based on this analysis, the IRT determined that the proximate cause of the Antares launch vehicle failure was an explosion within the AJ-26 rocket engine installed in the main engine 1 position. The AJ-26 engine used for Antares is based on a core Russian NK-33 rocket engine designed and manufactured in the early 1970s in support of the Russian N-1 moon program. Aerojet Rocketdyne modifies the NK-33 configuration for use on U.S. launch vehicles, such as operation at higher power level and engine gimbling. Again, the IRT concluded that the cause of the explosion on launch was the loss of rotor radial positioning resulting in contact and frictional rubbing between the rotary and stationary components within the engine liquid oxygen turbo pump hydraulic balance assembly seal package. Uh, what? Okay, back to basics. A rocket engine is basically a box with a hole in it. You fill the box with high pressure gas, it escapes through the hole at high speed and produces thrust. There's basically two ways you can think about this. The one I think is more intuitive for beginners is pressure. The pressure is distributed around the outside of the box, but obviously the solid side has more area than the side with the hole in it, 
so there will be a net force in that direction. With real rocket engines, this is a bit more complicated because the geometry is more complex and the pressure is not equal everywhere. But once you've come to terms with that, the easier and more robust way to deal with it and actually analyze rocket engines is to look at the conservation of momentum. The exhaust that's coming out of the rocket's nozzle might spread out, but it will still have an average velocity in this direction. That exhaust will also have a flow rate in kilograms per second. Now, if you just multiply that mass flow by that exit velocity, you get the rate of change of momentum which is the literal definition of a force. In more general terms, the rocket engine is accelerating mass in one direction, so it must accelerate in the opposite direction because every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Now, this combustion chamber and nozzle might be what you think of when you hear rocket engine, but it is not the most important or most complex part of the engine. In fact, there's almost never any moving parts in this entire part of the engine. Even if it's actively cooled, meaning you pump fuel around it to keep it from melting, that's still just static tubing. All of the mechanical complexity of a rocket engine is in how you get the fuel in to the combustion chamber. Because regardless of how you think about it, it should be clear that the higher pressure you have in your combustion chamber, the more thrust you're going to get. But to get fuel into that combustion chamber, you have to pump it at even higher pressures. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to flow into the combustion chamber. So you need a pump that can produce extremely high pressures and move a lot of propellant very quickly. You can't use pistons because your engine would be constantly starting and stopping. You need something that can do this continuously. And it turns out the best option is a turbo pump. If you're familiar with turbochargers on cars, this is basically the same thing, except you use it for oxygen and for fuel. The main difference between a turbo pump and a turbocharger is, of course, that the turbo pump is dealing with liquid oxygen and liquid fuel, and typically the turbine that runs the turbo pump is not using the actual exhaust from the main engine. You can do that, but it's rare. Usually, there is a separate smaller rocket engine that burns at much lower temperatures that is specifically designed to drive the turbine. Now there is a lot of complexity here and a lot of different ways to do this, but that's not super relevant to how this engine failed. As this turbo pump is spinning at very high RPM, it's drawing fuel into it and it's actually creating some thrust upstream. It's essentially acting like a liquid breathing jet engine. To keep the turbine from moving, you have a thrust bearing at the end of the shaft, which it can push against, but it will still allow it to rotate with minimal friction. And there's also sealed bearings around the shaft to keep it from wobbling. These are sealed to keep everything separated. You don't want the hot exhaust from the turbine to mix with the fuel or the oxygen. This is what the HBA seal package is. And when the IRT says they lost radial positioning, what they mean is this shaft was wobbling. For whatever reason, it was not spinning on the center axis, which meant it was scraping on every revolution, which meant it was damaging the bearing and also generating a lot of heat. Now you might think that the explosion was caused by the seal failing and oxygen mixing with fuel and obviously exploding with the heat, but that's not quite what happened. In the report, they describe this as an oxygen fire, which to me makes it sound like there was no mixing between the fuel and the oxygen. So what burned? Well, in a high pressure, pure oxygen environment, basically anything can burn, not just fuel, but even things like plastic can burn so energetically that we actually use plastics and rubbers as fuels in hybrid rocket engines. And even things that normally don't burn at all, like metal, can burn under these conditions. So once this fire started, everything from the lubrication and the bearing to the housing of the turbo pump itself could all be burning. That gives you a massive spike in pressure, but also damages the strength of the housing, meaning that even if it survives the initial pressure spike, it is going to fail very quickly. And if we look back at the video, I think this is what's happening. Before the engine actually explodes, the exhaust gets very bright. This is tiny particles of molten metal and burning lubrication. Basically, molten burning parts of the engine are coming out, and this is causing an extra bright glow. Shortly after, you see a massive explosion and a complete loss of thrust. This looks like the moment 
when the turbo pump housing finally burst and destroyed both engines. The IRT was not able to isolate a single technical root cause for the Engine 15 fire and explosion, but they did narrow it down to three options which could on their own have caused a failure or could have in combination. The first is the design of the HBA and the thrust bearing. The IRT couldn't provide much detail on this because it's proprietary, but they felt that these components were susceptible to oxygen fires. The AJ26 engines were not subjected to a thorough qualification program to demonstrate their operational capability and margin for use on Antares. Furthermore, the acceptance test program ATP established for the AJ26 engines was not sufficient to test and screen the engines for these design sensitivities and potential workmanship issues that could exacerbate the sensitivities. In other words, they under-tested the engines when they were first selecting them to use on this rocket, and they were not adequately screening the specific engines that would fly on every mission. The second possible cause was foreign object debris, or FOD. During the investigation, they detected some FOD within the engine which is believed to have been there prior to the explosion. This appears to be the weakest of the root causes as they didn't find any impact damage on the impeller that would indicate the FOD led to the fire. And the third and final technical root cause seems to be the most important to this specific mission failing. Forensic investigation performed by Orbital ADK and NASA discovered the presence of a defect in the turbine housing bearing bore that was not consistent with the design requirements. The investigation determined that the defect was introduced during machining of the bearing bore housing and was therefore present in the engine during the acceptance test program and prior to the launch. Forensic investigation of a separate engine which had failed its acceptance testing program in May of 2014 discovered the presence of a similar non-conforming defect in the housing bearing bore. Sufficient information is not available without further engine inspections and tests to conclude that the presence of this manufacturing defect would always result in the failure of an engine during operation. Now to me, this third cause seems the most important, but of course, all three need to be addressed. Based on these technical findings, they provided technical recommendations. The first was to halt use of the AJ-26 until further qualification could be done. Orbital ATK was already planning to replace the AJ-26 with the RD-181, so the second recommendation is to test that engine thoroughly before implementing it. The third was to add additional sensors on future missions so if another failure occurs, the investigation will be a lot easier. The fifth was to improve their verification process to reduce the likelihood of fog in the engine. The sixth was to add better protections against moisture getting into the engine. And the seventh was basically that Orbital ATK and NASA both need to have a better understanding of how the engine is designed, certified, and operated. Now, this is all great in hindsight now that we've had a failure, but what could the program do to prevent other failures from popping up? Well, the IRT also gave a list of programmatic findings and programmatic recommendations. First off, they did find that there was a clear understanding of who carried the risk in the CRS program. But across that program, they found that there was varying levels of risk which were considered acceptable. They found that the current launch vehicle assessments gave a false sense of security regarding the overall risk of these missions. Also, that the proprietary nature of vehicle information, which has prevented me from finding more information on these turbo pumps is actually serving as an artificial barrier in limiting communications. Jumping forward to the sixth finding, they found that Orbital ATK had been suffering from risk creep, meaning that every successful mission was making them less aware of the potential risks. The seventh was that Orbital ATK and even Aerojet Rocketdyne lacked sufficient knowledge of the NK-33 that they were using. This lack of understanding means lower confidence in the risk assessments made by both of these companies. They laid out six programmatic recommendations to address these issues, which included changes to how launch vehicle assessments were made within NASA, establishing a working group which can openly discuss launch vehicle issues and risk. They should fully disseminate launch vehicle design, anomaly, and other information to relevant personnel. They should formalize their levels of acceptable risk. In future programs, they should also implement these programmatic changes. And finally, and perhaps most obviously, the service providers and NASA both need to have sufficient technical expertise and insight into the designs that they are using on their launch vehicles.
And of course, you already know that this would not be the last failure. During this period, there was four unmanned cargo resupply vehicles, and within the next 12 months, two more would fail. This destroyed expensive equipment and experiments, but also food and other supplies for the astronauts. And that would put the ISS program in a very delicate position. I'm Con Happy, and thank you for watching.